Good evening. Welcome to Training Tuesday. Tonight is a very special night in the life of Training Tuesday. Today we kick off season four of Training Tuesday. We started in, what would that be, 2019 with this interesting idea of how can we get leadership training into the local church without requiring anybody to have to travel anywhere and we were talking, we said, well, there's this platform called Zoom. Maybe we can try that. And who knew in 2019 that we would be Zooming everything? And so we're excited. And this year, we're kicking off something a little bit different. We are going to be focusing the fall season on vitality and how to help 100% of our churches become 100% vital. And we're going to go through a process over the next several months together so you don't want to miss any episode and just in case you don't know i am bill brown i'm the director of innovative evangelism for the baltimore washington conference but i also do work with churches in the peninsula delaware conference and tonight i have the pleasure and the privilege of broadcasting to you live from camp pacomas which is a camp retreat and camping ministry of the peninsula Delaware Conference, and this is actually my first time at Camp Acomas, and it is beautiful, and uh, the hospitality has been wonderful, and so enjoying myself very much as I'm also on a retreat for part of this week. We're also joined by Lauren Harris. She is our coordinator of congregational development for the Baltimore Washington Conference, and she too do, does work with the Peninsula Delaware Conference, so both she and I um, affiliate with both annual conferences. So we are just glad that you would join us this evening. A couple of things before we get into prayer. Uh, the chat is disabled, so you're not able to use the chat to communicate. But actually, I'm going to have to, that's going to be, um, I am changing that setting for a second, I think. Actually, I'm going to ask Lauren to make me a co-host again, because I had to exit the room, and when I came back, that uh, changed the setting on that. And so there we go. Now I can do that. Um, so for our attendees, you're able to chat with Lauren and I, and that is only if you're having a technological issue. Um, the reason we've got the chat set up is we'll broadcast some links and some instructions throughout the evening, and you'll be able to see those links in the chat. If you do have questions for us as we go through our presentation, you use the Q&A feature, which is part of Zoom, and you can ask the questions, and we'll, we'll get to them. Some we might answer throughout the evening, but we will also get to all of them that we can get to at the conclusion of our presentation. So before we go any further, let's take a moment to pray together. So if you would pray with me. Holy and gracious God, we give you thanks for gathering us together. For even though we are in separate locations, separated by roads and fields and bridges and bodies of water, we are still united as one. For we are all a part of the body of Christ. We are part of the body of Christ, known as the United Methodist Church, and for that we give you thanks. And so as we gather tonight, oh God, open us up to new ways of exploring who we are as the children of God and who you've called us to be. We ask this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, let us just jump right in. Tonight's topic, and we can go to the slides tonight. And as we get that going, tonight's topic is about getting started on a congregational pathway with the Readiness 360. So we're gonna show you how the Readiness 360, which is a tool we offer to both annual conferences at no cost to you because we use the mission shares that you, have, that you give to the annual conference to underwrite and undergird this ministry. And the Readiness 360 helps your congregation really know where you are as the body of Christ 
and where you are in God's movement in the world. It, it's designed to help you get unstuck so you can discover God's right next step for your church. And really one thing we have learned over the last couple of years of this pandemic is that we really do need to be nimble and we need to be ready to partner with God to maximize our impact on the world so that we can bless our community, so that we can make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. And the key to real to understand is this is not about, you know, quote unquote, growing the church. Being a vital congregation is not about size. It's about impact. And I've worked with very large congregations that are not vital. And I've worked with very small congregations that are incredibly vital because it's all related to the impact that they're having on their communities in the name of Jesus Christ. And in order to have impact, we need to reclaim some of the foundational DNA of the Jesus movement. And we need to reclaim and relook at and realign with the impact that Jesus had on this world. And so the Readiness 360 is an assessment that helps you evaluate the behaviors, patterns, and attitudes that contribute to success or failure when you are really trying to take some risks and be bold and step out in faith to serve a God that has given you a mission that is larger than you could even imagine. And so let's go on to the next slide. As we think about tending the soil that is our congregation and is our mission field, we used to say that healthy things grow, but the reality is unhealthy things also grow. Weeds grow, diseases grow. And so what we're really trying to do is maximize the healthy things. And so the Readiness 360 helps us identify those areas in which we are healthy so that we can leverage them. And it also points out those areas that we may be unhealthy so that we can address them. Because as we look at what could grow within the life of our congregation through the Readiness 360, through our congregational vitality pathways, we hope that new small groups could grow, new worship communities could grow, new people groups could grow, new age level ministries could grow, new outreach initiatives could grow, that new ministries would be dispersed and released into your community, new campuses, maybe even new congregation, congregations your church might want to help plant. It's all about multiplication. And the Readiness 360 helps us get at the root of what we can do well and what we can multiply. It also means how we can multiply leaders and how we can recruit and form and develop and then release them. You see, we're called to let go of the status quo so that we can expand our reach to share the good news of Jesus Christ with others, particularly those who are not currently affiliated with other church. Because we need to think about our mission beyond just simply caring for the people who are already with us. And we need to really carefully evaluate everything we do in light of our stated purpose and mission, making disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. So we're gonna look at some scripture for a second. As we go into the next slide, this idea of growth and multiplication, it's biblical. The principles we're talking about have more to do with culture and soil conditions than any particular church growth strategy. Because if the soil isn't right, then no amount of strategy, no amount of seed will produce the yield of God's preferred future. So I just wanna share with you the scripture from Matthew 18 verses three through eight. And if, if you hung around church for any number of years, you might recognize this as the parable of the sower. And the version we're using is from Eugene Peterson's The Message. A farmer planted seed. As he scattered the seed, some of it fell on the ground and birds ate it. Go on. Do, do, do. 
Some fell on the gravel. It sprouted quickly, but it didn't put down roots. So when the sun came up, it withered just as quickly. Some fell in the weeds. As it came up, it was strangled by the weeds. Some seed fell on good earth and produced a harvest beyond their wildest dreams. The Readiness 360 is designed to help your congregation identify what your soil needs are and create good earth because good earth supports the following things. Good earth um, supports form the formation and multiplication of disciples and leaders, it, formation and multiplication of small groups, the formation and multiplication of worship services, um, formation and multiplication of faith communities, all of this so that we can have a great harvest, not for ourselves, but for the kingdom of God. And that's what we're going to do. So let's walk through, let's talk about what the Readiness 360 measures. So we want to raise the spiritual temperature in your congregation. And so the first thing that the Readiness 360 measures is what we call spiritual intensity. All great Christian movements are intense spiritually. They're marked by a deep love for God and a surrendering to what God wants to do through us. So it is critical that a spiritual fire burns within the hearts and souls of those that are leading and participating in the life of your church. Without a personal passion for Christ, we lack an adequate source of spiritual energy for vital and multiplying ministry. This is kind of what drives everything else. The spiritual intensity of your congregation is at the core of what you're able to do in ministry to and with your community. And so there are some characteristics of what a congregation with strong spiritual intensity looks like. Let's go to that next slide. So churches with strong spiritual intensity, there's an expectation of encountering the living Christ by people personally, but also that when people come to the church, they expect to, to encounter Christ. Um, they strongly uh, spiritually intense churches practice spiritual disciplines like prayer, Bible study, fasting, Christian works, but they do it not just as individuals. They practice these as a congregation communally as well. In spiritually intense church, people are willing to take risks as an expression of their faith and trust in God. That'd be the next point. There we go. So they're willing to risk. And finally, leaders, both paid leaders and unpaid leaders, they demonstrate spiritual vitality. So those who are calling on the big black mark at the top of the screen, thank you for bringing that to our attention. That just has to do with the quality of internet connection we're, we're dealing with tonight. So don't worry. I know there's some things that may be hard to see. So um, let's try, let me try something, Lauren. Mm -hmm. let's, let's stop sharing for a second. Let me see. And uh, let me see something. So for those who brought that to our attention that I appreciate. So let me I'm going to try to share my screen for a second, Lauren. See if okay. that may, see if that makes a difference. Um, and if it does, we figured it out. If it doesn't, can people is the is it gone? So those uh, if the person who alerted us to uh, the chat about the uh, the dark box and the thing, I don't see it any longer. You could just drop us something in the chat. Um, to let us know. So the second thing that the Readiness 360 measures is what we call dynamic relationships. And so making disciples really depends upon our relational skills. I'm going to 
and it's still appearing. So I'm not sure what that is. And if it is, do you see it, Lauren, a large black box? I do. Now I see it on my screen now that you're sharing. I didn't see it before. All righty. So that could be an issue with Google. All right. Let me see. I apologize, people. We did not usually have these technical difficulties, but today we are, of course, because we're launching into season four. So I appreciate everyone who has said that there is an issue. Um, and what I'm going to try to do is the following. Let me see if I can do something about this. And if I can, great. If I can't, then we will see what we can do. Uh, let me see if that solves it. Somebody, you know, we have got the smartest and some of the brightest people from both annual conference who are helping us tonight. So I'm going to try something to see if that works. They gave us a suggestion and I'm going to share again. And you get to see all of the different tabs that I tend to keep open till I do that. What do you think, Lauren? Do you see it still? I do not see the black boxes anymore. All righty. So I'm going to give a shout out for a second to... Um, uh to emily hart gets a shout out because she gave us a suggestion that that happens to her when she's optimizing the screen for video and uh, that's exactly what i was doing and so she is amazing so you get a prize emily hart and your prize is you might get a visit from the director of innovative evangelism on a sunday morning for worship who knows? We'll find out. So thank you all very much. So dynamic relationships, jumping right back into it. Relationships with one another and with guests and with our community are shaped by our gospel values. And so being and making disciples of Jesus Christ, it really is wild and it is chaotic and it's unpredictable, but it is so much, it is such an enjoyable, important um role that if we're not sharing our faith then it is just um becoming stagnant and so the reality is to have those dynamic relationships and it's a lot of it is with people with inside at this point with inside the life of the church or how are the relationships with people within the life of the church. And here are some characteristics of those with churches with uh, healthy dynamic relationships. There is a practice of strong welcoming behaviors. It's more than a program. It's a way of how you treat newcomers. And believe me, I know I've been a pastor for 32 years or under appointment for 32 years. I was in the local church for 28 years. And a lot of churches think they're friendly. And I have visited a lot of churches on Sunday morning. Some knew I was coming, some didn't. And not all of our churches are as welcoming as they think they are. And so having strong welcoming behaviors and keeping that as a value is important of a church that is, has healthy dynamic relationship. There's also a strong track record of being able to bring people from outside of the faith community into participation in the faith community. So it's not about reaching people who have already been part of another church. It's healthy dynamic relationships, bring in people who've not been a part of any church. Um, it's also, they show positive experience of partnering with other leaders in groups. There is a culture of healthy teamwork and leader development, including healthy conflict, uh, transformation and management skills. And finally, leaders, both paid and unpaid, who function well as a team. The Readiness 360 also uh, really focuses on trying to keep the main thing the main thing. And what it's looking at is missional alignment. Um, alignment in the church 
is often looked at as, as herding cats, less than a marching band in perfect uh, formation. So there's a lot of moving parts within the life of the local church. And so it's, it's about getting the leadership and getting the congregation to agree on what it looks like to organize the life of the church around making disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. That if that mission forms everything we do, then we're beginning to align all that we do to that mission. And so the passion could be there because our spiritual intensity is high and there could be great dynamic relationships. But if we're not all moving in the same direction, then we're not going to have as great of impact as we could possibly have. And so let's take a look at this video and give you an idea of what I'm talking about. Hopefully my internet connection is strong enough. There we go. segment of everybody's hearts lighting up it's just that idea of let your light shine you know let's not hide it under a bushel let us live out that great commission of going into all the world to make disciples and really the better translation of that is as you are going make disciples as you're going to the grocery store as you're going to school as you're going to work as you're going to the gym as you're going anywhere you should be in the process of building relationships to make disciples of jesus christ for the transformation of the world and when we begin to focus beyond our buildings we can reach out for those who are not yet a part of our faith communities So if I were to look at what your church is doing in terms of missional alignment, if I, if I were to look at what your church is doing from a day to day, would I be able to tell what business you're in? Would I really be able to tell that your main thing is about making disciples? And so what that looks like for churches that have a strong missional alignment, they really have a clear understanding that they have a mandate from Jesus to reach new people. They realize that they are aligned to a clear direction. They have a clear understanding of this is where God is calling us to, to be. This is what, who God is calling us to be. This is where God is calling us to go. And so we're going to funnel everything we do to that clear direction. Uh, churches with strong missional alignment have uh, leaders that are engaged in good strategic thinking, that meetings aren't you know, board meetings and council meetings and committee meetings that, that take place aren't just about reporting what has happened, but they're engaged in strategic conversation about possibilities. There's also an ability to make 
decisions about resources based on priority as opposed to based on pleasing people or maintaining a status quo. And there's also a shared sense of competency about a church's ability to start new ministries. The churches with strong missional alignment really believe that they are capable of starting new things. And the last thing that the Readiness 360 measures is um, what we call cultural openness. These churches savor the gift of diversity that is within their communities. Now, cultural openness has nothing to do with political leanings. It's not about your theology. It's with, it's about open mind. It had really not even about open mindedness. Um, cultural openness is just how open are you to those who are different than you. It's not about being tolerant. It's about how big is your comfort zone. It asks those deeper questions is how hospitable can you be? How easy is it for you or how important is it for you to make room for those who are different, who are newer, who are younger, who are older, who think differently? And, and great churches, they excel at being able to recontextualize uh, the gospel for this new time and new place in which we find ourselves that, but we can only do that when we begin to partner with people who are in our mission field, people who are outside the walls of our building so that we can find out what their needs are. One thing I've discovered over the years is churches are really good at telling the community what we think they need without really listening to the community to find out what their clamoring for, what they're yearning for, what their fears are, their hopes are, their dreams are. But if we're not open to those that are different from us, then we may not hear what they have to say, and we may not be able to meet those needs as they come up. And so characteristics of churches that are strong with cultural openness is that they have an attitude and behaviors that support receptivity to people who aren't like them. That it doesn't mean about agreeing with people who don't who aren't like them. It's just about being open to and welcoming to and loving towards people who aren't like them. There's also an ability to form meaningful commu uh, meaningful community with people who maybe puzzle us or who offend us in certain ways, but we're still able to come alongside and develop community with them. It's also this perception that diversity in our churches is a good thing. All the different multi-levels of diversity. There's an energy with working with different kinds of people. We value experiences that help us. We have valuable experiences that help us reach young people. We have a willingness and ability to share power with new people. Well, there's the young people. I had it out of order on my script. Um, but we, and when I talk about reaching young people, it's not just about getting them in the door so that we have a future. It's about engaging them in the life of the congregation now and giving them leadership responsibility and sharing power with young people and helping them make the decisions rather than us making the decisions for them. And then churches have a proven ability to reach people that are in our communities that aren't like us. And so that's kind of all of the background of, of what we're measuring and what you can walk away with when your congregation takes the Readiness 360 survey. But I asked, uh, invited Lauren to come share with us really some of the process around uh, implementing a Readiness 360. So Lauren, so thank you so much for um, being willing uh, to join us in this conversation. So thank you. Thank you for having me, Bill. And I am the person that you would go to to start this process um, to participate in the Readiness 360 survey. And so I'm just going to get into the logistics and some practical aspects of the program. So I'm going to add in the chat the website on the BWC where you can find 
um, information about the Readiness 360, and then you can put in a request for an account. So you may have seen Bill flipping through the, the slides. And um, if you decide that your church wants to start on this journey um, for the Congregational Vitality Pathways, um, you would start with an intent to apply. And it's found on the website that I just listed in the chat. And, and, you'll and Lauren, I'm mm -hmm. going to add something. I pardon, pardon me for interrupting. Here is your bonus, people, for attending tonight's webinar. You are the first ones to know that this document is live. You can click on that link right now, and you are the first ones who have the opportunity to apply. And what does that what does that get you, Lauren, if they do fill out that that application? Well, that gets you that gets us your information, and it also allows me to know that you would like a Readiness 360 account. So I can go ahead and set up your account, and you can get the process started. So after you fill out this intent to apply form, a Google form that's found on the BWC website, um, you would put in the information for the person that's going to be managing your Readiness 360 account. So the contact information that you would share with us on this form, that's what I would use to set up your Readiness 360 account. So the name and the email and the telephone number that you use, that's what I would use to set up your account. And so after I manually put your information in, you'll receive an automated email from Readiness 360 to let you know that you're all set and ready to go, and it'll provide you instructions to log in. There's also, I'm, I'm, I'm just hot off the presses. I'm just known that it is also on the Peninsula of Delaware Conference website. And so everybody awesome. is able to access this. This is for both annual conferences. This is not just a BWC thing. All of the Readiness 360 and the Vitality Pathways are open to both annual conferences to participate. Yes, and I see a question in the chat. Does this cost each church or is it free for us to use? It costs each church in both conferences zero dollars. This is a free tool that the conferences the conference provides for you. So it doesn't and, cost you a thing. And I would say I always like to add um, when people wonder where their mission shares go, the mission shares you pay, the apportionments, depending on the language you use in your local church, the, your apportionment, your mission shares is what's paying for this. And so there is no cost to you now, but because of your faithfulness in supporting the ministries of the annual conference, we're able to offer these things for free. And I would say, I do appreciate questions that, that do come in through the chat, but please, uh, I want to remind you to use the Q&A as well. It's just easier to monitor one, one uh, dialogue box. So Carry on, Lauren. I'm sorry. Thanks, Bill. Okay, so once you get your automated email from Readiness 360, and again, I'm going to be your contact person for Readiness 360. So if you don't receive your audit automated email with your login information, or if there's anything that's going on that you have confusion about, you can always reach out to me. So after you log in, and I've already set up your account, and I set up each um, church with one survey, um, you're going to be permitted to um, execute one survey for your church. And so after you log in into Readiness 360, you'll start to create your survey, set up your survey. And it's very easy because for the purposes of the Congregational Vitality Pathways, we only ask you to customize your survey by using two open-ended questions that we provide. Now, when you create your survey in Readiness 360, you'll see that there are a lot of customization options um, that will give you some demographics. It'll talk about cultural aspects, but you don't even have to select any of that. All you have to do is customize your survey with two open-ended questions that we provide you. And Bill's gonna go ahead on our slide. And I've already gone over this information. Well, you can go back one slide. 
So on the previous slide, I talked about how we're gonna provide you with one survey um, in Readiness 360. And once you get your information and you log in, you're going to go in and create your survey. And that will lead you to the page that you see on the screen, customize your survey. And so you'll see the survey name, which is required, your congregation's formal name. And when it says formal name and informal name, I just like, I'll put, for example, Bunker Hill United Methodist Church, I'll spell it out. And then for an informal name, I'll put Bunker Hill or Bunker, Bunker Hill UMC. So you don't have to get too deep with that. And if you go to the next slide, this is what I was referencing when I said that there are different ways that you can customize a survey in Readiness 360. You can customize it um, via ministry contacts, the average age of church participants, et cetera. But we're not even asking you for the purposes of the congregational vitality to go into these customizations. Next slide. What we are asking you to do is you will see on your screen that there are options for you to put in open-ended questions. Now, what this means is Readiness 360 will automatically generate the questions for your survey. Um, they're multiple choice questions, but there is an opportunity for you to allow your congregants to actually type in answers to a specific question. And so the questions that, you can go to the next slide, the questions that we want you to use for the Congregational Vitality Pathways are, one, what is God calling your church to focus on now? And two, what do we need to change to live into God's preferred future? Those are the two questions um, that we're asking you to use. I see something in the chat that says it's very difficult to see the slides. Um, I'm just trying to give you a general idea of what the web page will look like in Readiness 360. But what I what we just showed you is just the page that where you can create and customize a survey. And I would also I would also add, Lauren, that we are recording tonight's presentation, and we will have by the end of the week beginning of next week, we'll have the uh, recording posted with the slides posted. So if there's some things you can't see or you miss something, you'll be able to go back and they're also searchable. You'll be able to go back from both annual conferences and find this information. Yes, thank you. So you can move forward to the next slide. Okay, so after you've created your survey, you have emailed your congregants and let them know that you have a live survey in Readiness 360, and you've marketed your survey during your Sunday morning services or during your marketing email blast, and you've got your congregation to participate in these surveys, you will then close your survey in Readiness 360. There'll be an option for you to close that survey and Readiness 360 will automatically generate three types of reports based on your survey. Now, you will see that the three types are the summary of the report, the executive report, and the complete report. And you'll see from this slide that the summary just gives you a general overview of where your church falls as far as the four focus areas that Bill talked about, spiritual intensity, cultural openness, et cetera. So the first report is just a summary. The executive report goes into a little bit more detail. It talks about where your church um, falls in the four areas. It gives you a general overview. And then the report will provide you with some leadership tips on how you could better um, improve and accelerate what you're doing at your church. And then the final report that Readiness 360 provides is the complete report. Now this report, you get everything and you can read the answers to the open-ended questions that we provided for you. And as you can see from the slide that we're 
advising you <laughs> to be very wise in who you share this report with at the church, because even though we have very specific open-ended questions for the congregational vitality pathways, oftentimes people will use it as an opportunity to vent about whatever problems that they see at the church or whatever suggestions that they want to provide. And I'm gonna I'm gonna say that I'm gonna say it a little, <laughs> a little differently, Lauren, because you okay. and I we, you and I interpret these reports. It's part of our yes, job. We do. And the the these surveys are anonymous, so we don't know. We know who in your church has taken it. You won't. We can find that out, but we don't know. We don't have access to how any individual answers it. And so I've read through some of these reports, and sometimes, not often, but sometimes some of the responses we get in the open-ended questions are mean, and some of them are hateful, and some of them, unfortunately, are unchristian. But once it's written down, it's, you can't undo it. And so for those who are reading it, we want to we don't want to cause harm. We don't want the survey to cause pain. And so you're really looking at some of your most trusted people who are mature enough to be able to handle and and brush off some of this venting if it takes place. It doesn't take place on every survey. Um, but once in a while, a response comes through that just is harmful. And so you really want to be sure that those who are reading it can handle that and not internalize it so much. But the other reality is if if that if that is the case, then you reach out to your district superintendent or you reach out to Lauren and I and we want to kind of help you deal with some of that because we've been there and we know what they say and it is hard um but the rest of the information you get is so much more valuable than the potential for somebody who has an ax to grind to grind it in this particular survey. Yes, thanks, Bill. Um, there's a question and it says, um, how can we help our older folks who aren't as internet savvy to fill out this survey? Can we offer a print option for them? Now, this question ha has come up a lot in the past year, and unfortunately, there isn't a print option. And this is where we're going to have to be very creative and compassionate for our um, older members. I've had pastors who have walked them through the survey, sat down with them, um, provided a time where they could meet up and they help them with the survey. Um, also at the same time, while, you know, not monitoring what they're answering or typing, but just providing a time where they can assist them. I am also a resource that your older members can use if they need for me to walk them through a test survey. Um, I can do that. You can reach out to me, my office. Um, but we're, this is just when we're going to have to be creative and compassionate for our older um, members. And the reason why there isn't a print version is the program randomly generates the order of the questions. And so if you print up, a, you know, you could say, oh, I'll just do a sc screenshot and just print up the questions. Unfortunately, what you might have will not match how the questions come up when you actually try to input the data. And so Lauren's 100 percent correct. We've had churches get so creative and have workshops and have internet cafes that they set up the church or they meet people at the library. Um, so this is an opportunity and and we've worked with churches that are exactly as you described and they've been able to do it. Yes, you can go on to the next slide. Okay, so Bill mentioned this earlier, but Bill and I, we annotate the reports that are generated um, based off of your church's survey. And so um, this is an example of how the annotation of the report starts. And we just like to highlight a few things in your report. Um, we start off by letting you know how many people have taken the survey, um, and then we identify the strongest areas 
um, in your church. Um, this one is spiritual intensity. And then we let you know what are some of the challenges. And this one happens to be missional alignment. So this is how your annotated report will begin. Um, you'll also see that though you'll see the bunny rabbits that will let you know um, where, what your stronger areas are. Here you'll see on this report, spiritual intensity is two and a half um, bunny rabbits, and it'll give you an explanation of what that means for you. Um, dynamic relationships, missional alignment, and cultural openness, all four areas that Bill went over. You'll see where your church falls, and someone will go over that with you. Um, what does it mean? And how you can move forward. You can go to the next slide, unless you want to say something. Oop. I'll just say, we see the questions that are coming in. We'll answer all of those questions at the end of the presentation. So keep yes. them coming. Keep you them skipped coming. a slide. Let's go back one. Okay, so you'll all... <laughs> You skip through so many slides, but you'll also see that you'll see a percentage of where your church um, lies um, with spiritual intensity, cultural openness, missional alignment. Um, you'll just get a, a more defined definition of where your church falls and we'll explain that to you. You can move forward. Okay, and then there's the middle section and it will talk, it will highlight some bullet points that are major drivers in a certain area. So you'll see on this report that we annotated, you'll see some pluses and minuses. So we will, um, the report generates um, these responses based on your members surveys. And then we will let you know if these are accelerators and that's where you see the pluses or if they are decelerators, and that's where you see the minuses. Um, and then we'll just highlight that for you. For example, this one talks about many people have an expectation of encountering the living Christ personally and or in the congregation. That's an accelerator toward that area of spiritual intensity. So you'll see these bullet points under each um, area that Readiness 360 focuses on. So this one is in the area of spiritual intensity. So the bullet point says that many people have that expectation of meeting Jesus in their personal lives and when they come into the body of believers. And so that is an accelerator. And the survey will also show us what are some decelerators. Um, people are a bit risk adverse and hesitant to take bold steps of faith. So we'll just highlight that, like these are some areas where you, you are not accelerating or you are breaking um, that your church can address. And each section will have those accelerators and breaks. You can go to the next slide. Okay, and then the bottom section of each area, spiritual intensity, mission alignment, cultural openness, you'll have this bottom section. And so it'll show where your church has scored um, in these areas of strength and in the areas of improvement. Now, and what you'll see, this is an annotated report, so it's all marked up, but we will just star the areas where your church is doing really well. And you'll see the lines are arrows that are going to the bullet points we will highlight some of the disconnects. For example, sometimes the survey will say, um, we are open to different kinds of people and diversity at our church. But then when the, we, we look at the report, we'll see that um, you'll have a lower percentage in people's willingness to go outside of their community and speak to different kinds of people. So, that's where you'll see the arrows. We'll say there's a little bit of a disconnect here between what people are saying and some of the strengths in your church. So we'll annotate that for you and explain that to you. Um, all right. And you'll see that you'll see this kind of breakdown for each section in Readiness 360 after we've annotated your report 
stars are strengths which you believe will be helpful to build on. And then, as I said before, we will draw connections between the scores and your accelerators, your pluses and your breaks, your minuses. And I, I would add to that, Lauren, just so there's some clarity. Um, you get an annotated report if you are um, participating in one of our three vitality pathways. And so for churches who just decide they want to take this, let's let's talk about maybe that just helps talk about some next steps. Um, so at a minimum, your congregation could work through the leadership tips that are provided. So there are 22 possible leadership tips that could be generated. And usually the system will cut off at 10 that are customized for the results your congregation gets. And they're listed from one to 10 and one is the easiest for you to achieve and 10 is the most challenging. So at a minimum, you could start and group them together and say, okay, we're gonna focus on one of these for this next season. And we're gonna focus on three of these. Probably not, you know, if you have 10, you may not want to focus on more than five, but also if you have 10 leadership tips, that means you have a lot to work on and you definitely want to be involved in one of our congregational vitality pathways, which are also at no cost to your congregation. And so as we look at these vitality pathways, that's really the ideal is the Readiness 360 is going to give you a 360 view of where your church is in all of those areas and how healthy it is. And if you notice, none of those areas have to do with attendance. None of them have to do with the budget you have. It doesn't have to do with how much money that you bring in, how many fundraisers you do. It has nothing to do with what we have normally considered healthy metrics for a local church. It really has to do with those biblical understandings of being spiritually intense, how well we're developing our relationships within the people, within the walls of our building, how aligned we are to the mission God's given us, and how open we are to people outside of our building, particularly those who are different than us. And so if you, if you choose to participate and you fill out the intent to apply form, Really, the big purpose of the intent to apply form is just to show interest and so that we can have the information we need to set up that Readiness 360 survey. And then um, we'll talk a little bit about what you do to apply for one of the Congregational Vitality Pathways. But the first step for any of the pathways is to do the Readiness 360. And the first pathway that we um, have to offer is what we call the Launch Initiative. So what we know are vital congregations are focused on the future. They don't dismiss their past. They know they're rooted in a past, but they don't dwell in the past. The way I like to, to, um, to frame it is vital churches are more protective of their future than they are of their past. They're more protective of their future than they are of their past. And they're always asking the question, what's next? And really, that's what the disciples were asking after the resurrection. They were really asking Jesus, what's next? And Jesus gave them the answer. When he gathered together on that mountain in Matthew 28, and Jesus said, I've received all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. Look, I myself will be with you every day until the end of the present age. So in that, what we call the Great Commission, Jesus was telling them what was next. So if you've been asking the question, if your congregation has been asking the questions, what's next? Or if these words of, of going outside your building to make disciples of Jesus Christ resonate with you and your congregation, then maybe you're ready for the launch initiative. And if you're not ready for the launch initiative, that can be, you know, some of that's going to be revealed in your uh, pathways application. It's going to be revealed in your readiness 360 scores. And you'll get an idea that maybe the launch initiative isn't right for us. So we also have the catalyst initiative. And the catalyst initiative is really designed to help your congregation do two things. It's designed to first help you love better. 
to love one another within your church better and to love your community better better it's also designed to help you discover your congregation's call and the unique um, gift you bring to your community and both the launch initiative actually all of our initiatives are year-long processes they're all cohort-based processes but the catalyst initiative is one that is designed for discovery exploration and renewal it empowers your congregation to initiate a spirit-led vision. It helps you to understand your community. It helps you ignite your faith into action. It helps you invigorate people to claim God's vision for your lives and your community. And so over the year, you're going to learn to more deeply and intentionally cultivate discipleship. You're going to learn how to discern. You're going to learn how to experiment. You're going to learn how to build better relationships with one another, with people in your community. You're going to learn how to evaluate and design ministry so that you have an impact. You're going to learn how to identify and leverage the assets and how to create alignment. So we hope that as a result, your congregation will increase your skills, confidence, and resilience so that you can create more transformed lives, so that you can then transform more lives. You're also given in all of our co all of our pathways, you're going to be given some type of guide or coach or synergist who's going to journey with your church to provide feedback and to provide expertise and to provide support as you journey as a congregation through that particular pathway. And then we have our readiness initiative. And one thing that that I realize is that churches of all shapes and sizes, are going through some challenging times. And, and your church might fall into this category. Maybe at one time you had a lively and vibrant building that you called a church home, and maybe it's just feeling more like a museum or a lot less vibrant. Or maybe you are just wrestling with what the future holds and you're asking yourselves, what can we do? Where can we find answers? Maybe you're just stuck and you don't know how to get unstuck. That's what the readiness initiative is for. And so after completing the readiness 360 survey, after having a facilitated conversation about the results, you'll be part of a 12 month cohort journey with a readiness guide that is going to take you through a process that's gonna give you a 360 degree view of your congregation. You're gonna investigate and explore the leadership, your ministries and your community. And the goal of the readiness initiative is to help your congregation discern your next faithful step. And so in order to help facilitate what your congregational team is doing, they're going to do some work together. And then there'll be town hall gatherings where the entire congregation can get together um, throughout the process to hear about what's happening and to learn more about the, the reality of where the congregation finds itself. And then there will be retreats for the team throughout the year so that you can learn more about each of those readiness 360 drivers and how they impact your congregation. And so um, what you can do next and some important dates to keep in mind is as we said, um, tonight, the intent to apply form is live. You can fill that out. But congregations have until November 1st to, to sign up for a Readiness 360. And that's really what the Intent to Apply form does. It gives you gives us the information we need to set up an account for you. And so you know, if you apply tonight, you can get started tonight, but you don't have to. Um, but after November, November 1st, we're not going to... Um, create any more accounts right away. So you wanna do that between now and November 1st. And then your church, if you choose, will have between now and February 15th, 2023, to apply for one of our pathways. And so Lauren's gonna drop in the chat, the website for the Vitality Pathways on the, or the web address. This is probably also on the Peninsula Delaware Conference website. Um, we'll look up that address as well. But on there is a sample application that you will be able to download and you can begin to fill out that 
paper application so that you can have all your ducks in a row so that you can fill out the online application before February 15th. So we wanted to give you as much time as possible to gather the information that you need in order to have a complete and robust application. And then between February 15th and March 15th, we announced decisions on March 15th. Between February 15th and March 15th, we can have some, we'll have some consultation with your district superintendents. We'll have some conversations with you as a participant who has applied. And then on, we'll announce on March 15th. So if you apply for a congregational vitality pathway, you will get into one of the three of them. So there is no cap on the number of churches who can participate. You may not get into the one you think you want to be in because we will base those decisions on your Readiness 360 report. We will base those decisions on your application, on your Discipleship Ministries report, on all of the information you provide for us. We have a discernment process that we use as a team because we want to put you in the pathway in which you are going to get the most valuable information and that you have the biggest, the greatest chance of succeeding. And so we don't want to put you into something that is going to be too easy for you. We also don't want to put you into something that is going to be too challenging for you in your congregation. And we've been pretty good in our pilot program and in this year in matching congregations to the correct pathway. And so we'll let you know on March 15th um, what pathway your congregation is in. And then on May 13th, um, the orientation retreat will take place for all of the pathways that will be taking place between 2023 and 2024. And so that's kind of the important dates. All of this information is on, um, I know it is on the Baltimore Washington Conference website. And were we able to look at the Peninsula Delaware website? Um, Lauren. Let me take a look right now. Okay. While she is looking, we do have some time for some questions. And so I'm going to just walk through some of these questions. Somebody did ask um, if they have to apply, does that mean space is limited? Uh, no, space is not limited. We will, we will do all that we can to make room for as many churches that wish to participate. So if you apply, it's one application for all three pathways. And as part of that application, yes, we do ask which pathway you think you'd like to be in and why you want to be in that one. And we take that into consideration. We take conversations with the district superintendent into consideration. Um, and so um, that, uh, that helps us to determine what's the best pathway. So if you apply, you will get into one of the three pathways. Then it's up to you to decide whether or not you want to do it. So if you get into a pathway and your congregation chooses you don't want to do it, there, this is not mandated, this is not forced. We just want to provide you the tools for you to be able to discern and discover and then implement what God's calling you to do next. Now, Lauren, we've got a couple of questions about um, participation. And uh, we've done, we have put one uh, thing in the chat. And um, as you are looking at that, Lauren, I, I was just given a note of, where else they can find that information. So the questions are about participation. How many people need to participate in the survey? What's the minimum number? How do we determine um, participation levels for to get an ad accurate result? We need at least 10% of your active members to participate in a Readiness 360 survey to get good numbers or 25 members so it's either or either 10 percent of your active members or at least 25 members whichever say, one best fits your church and and i'm going to add when we say active members they don't have to be members of the church but active people who are active in the life of the church and so if you have a very um, small number of people who are worshiping with you. Let's say, you know, maybe your congregation, you have 10 people who are in worship with you. Do all that you can to get all 10 to participate. Um, but, but, but Lauren's correct. It's, um, 
it is all about having that that number of of 10 percent of the worshiping congregation or 25 people pardon me as i'm getting some okay the next question says does the readiness 360 help determine which initiative is right for each church or do we self-select what is required of the church for each initiative the end result sounds good but it feels abstract okay so a couple of things all of this information in the details is oh can you put uh you just okay hold on a second um i need to look back at that question again okay um I'll pull it back. i got it okay so it's both and to the question asker. You will have an opportunity to tell us which one you think you want to be a part of, but ultimately the decision is based on your readiness 360 scores and your application and all of the information that you turn in. So we look at all of that for us to determine which is the best pathway. So let's say if you sign up and you think you're you're ready for the catalyst initiative but based on all the information that we review you're really ready for the launch initiative we'll have a conversation with you and your team in order to um in order to get the right placement for you and so what's required um what's required is that there be a team of five people only one of whom is the pastor and the pastor may not be in charge of the team. There has to be another point person for the team. And there is, depending upon the pathway, so with the Catalyst Initiative, it is a intensive year-long, both asynchronous and synchronous learning opportunity. So there's some online learning opportunity that take place that's self-paced, and there's some group work that takes place. And... Um, I've got people who are watching me who have my cell phone number, who are texting me all sorts of good information. And so, yes, Pendel Congregational Pathways is on your website. And I think Lauren did drop that yes. link into the chat. And so you can find it there. And um, so each of the pathways will have the same same size team. When you get in, we give you instructions for what you have to do for all of this. Um, and yes, it does sound uh, abstract. I know for the launch initiative, it's another uh, self-paced online, and then you'll work with your your um, field guide who will help you process the information. For the readiness initiative, there's a lot of data gathering, and there's a lot of interpretation of the data, and then a lot is um, then um, presented to the to the congregation so that everyone knows kind of this is what is really happening within the life of our church based on information that we're gathering. And so somebody else asks, is it mandatory for all congregations? No, it's not mandatory. Um, the way I, I have approached this, I kind of approached it from as a pastor and thought to myself, when I was serving in a local church, and I have served churches from the inner city of Baltimore out to uh, the suburbs, from very small to very large. And I just have asked myself, what tools did I need in each size congregation I was serving that could have helped me help them take their next faithful step? And so that's kind of how we've developed some of these pathways in order to do that. So no, you don't have to do it, but we just want to resource you so that if you're ready to discover that, um, you, you are able to come in. And this is not like a grant. We're, um, again, as I said, if you sign up, you will get into one of the pathways. And so unless we see a huge red flag that there is something that is like this huge, big, unresolved conflict, we'll have a conversation with you to see if this is the right fit for you and your congregation. Um, looking down, so should you... Um, should you talk to your pastor prior to applying so part of the yes you should we we don't want our clergy to to be surprised that you've asked to do a massive survey um into the life of your congregation and on the intent to apply form is the question who is your pastor and there is a question have you told your pastor you're applying for this for this process and so 
Yes, talk with them. Are the pastors aware of the readiness 360 and what it is? They should be. If they don't know what it is or they don't want to participate or they have questions, both Lauren and I are available for those one-on-one -on -one consultations, for those conversations to kind of bring pastors, to bring leadership in your church up to speed if you need it. Um, and so that's that's a very good question and we're available to help get you to the point of where you can be ready to participate. And then uh, the last question we have coming in is what would happen if leadership changed during this process? Um, it depends. How's that for a really good question? Really good answer. It depends. Um, it depends on if you're talking about if pastoral leadership should change. It depends on how bought in the um, lay leadership is into the process and the conversations that take place in the transition um, between pastors. On the other hand, we've had a couple of churches that did go through a pastoral transition, and because of the pastoral transition, they self-selected, and the lay leadership team was on board, they self-selected to stop participating because it was too much with the new pastor. And so we really try to take this case by case contextually because there really isn't a one size fits all oh my goodness right now i am i just have to be so excited because i tell you people that our conference lay leader attends every single training tuesday because we're on a retreat together you can't see her because she's blurry behind me but our conference lay leader dolores martin just walked in the room and there she is. So we are just blessed to have our conference lay leader of the Baltimore Washington Conference because she was just standing outside the door of the room where I'm broadcasting from at Camp Pocomath. Uh, join me. And, uh, and I understand that a lot of people were uh, participating in another room that are all on retreat together. So that is wonderful. Um, those are all the questions that have come in and I appreciate everybody's questions. I appreciate Lauren for being here tonight and for uh, helping um, lead some of this conversation. She is one of our Readiness 360 gurus. She knows so much about it and is just a, a joy to work with. So um, you take, we'll take advantage of that. Now, a couple of uh, announcements of what's coming up. Again, we are spending this season talking about vitality. And one of the ways that we know a church is vital is when they really know the people in their community and when they really interact with the people in their community. So next Tuesday, we are going to have a really great presenter, one of the best presenters I know. Her name is Lauren Harris. She is on your screen sitting next to me, although we're in two different parts of the state. Um, she is going to be presenting alongside some other people, some people from the Peninsula Delaware Conference, some other people from the Baltimore Washington Conference. She's going to be presenting a webinar on the Mission Insight Tool, which is a demographic and um, lifestyle segment um, tool that will tell you who is living around your church building. And not only who is living around your church building, but what they're looking for in a church, what they're looking for from the church, what they're looking for from pastors and from leadership and from people. And it is a rich tool that will help you begin to identify who God might be calling you to reach through your efforts of going out in your community. So if you have not signed up yet for next week's Training Tuesday, go to your respective um, conference websites. There are links on both conference websites for how you can register so that you can participate in next week's Training Tuesday. Uh, looking ahead to a couple of episodes, not only will we tell you who's in your neighborhood, in a couple of weeks we're going to have some people, um, some content experts who are going to come and join us and talk about how you can engage with people in your community by doing prayer walks and by doing relational one-on-ones. Um, later in October, 
we're going to have some experts come in and talk to us about how do we disciple people and how do we create intentional discipleship pathways? What does that even mean? What do they look like? What is included? And how can my church uh, start one? And then they'll come back. It's going to be kind of two weeks in a row on, on that topic where they'll come back and they'll talk about how we can actually get people um, involved in them. We're going to have a webinar on how to live and love like Jesus, and we're going to have a webinar on, on measuring our um, impact. And so somebody did ask, will these training webinars be every Tuesday? No, they're not every Tuesday. Right now, there's two in a row. Then we're going to take a couple of weeks off. Then we'll come back in October for a couple. And then we'll give you some time off. And then we'll come back in November for a couple. And um, they usually last from 7 p.m. until 8.30 on Tuesday evenings, that's where you know we come up with that great uh, creative title, Training Tuesday. And so you want to join us for that um, next week, and then you'll have a break. But all of that information are on both conference websites. Details about all of the pathways are on both conference websites, and information on how to apply are on both conference websites. So please take advantage of signing up for those. And so with that being said, we're going to wrap up our evening together. Again, thank you for joining us. It is such a joy to kick off the fourth season of Training Tuesday. I can't believe we've been doing this for four years and just the ability to be able to equip you and your congregation to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world is just such an honor and privilege. And so we appreciate you inviting us into your homes and giving us the opportunity to share um, something of, that we have. And, and one thing, I'm going to put a shameless plug in and we can drop this in the chat, Lauren. Lauren and I started a blog that launched um, last week called The Mission Shaped Church. And she'll put the web address in there. So we're going to share with you through this blog just some articles that we're writing on to help you become churches that go out and make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. So check that out. That just gives you an opportunity for us to share some additional resources with you. It's missionshapedchurch.com so that you can begin to align yourself with the mission of Jesus Christ of to go therefore and make disciples of all nations. And so we are glad that you're able to participate with us. Let me give us a blessing and a prayer as we conclude our time together. Holy and gracious God, we give you thanks. We thank you for a bold vision that's been placed before us by our Episcopal leader that we can have 100% of our churches at 100% vitality. And we just thank you for this opportunity to share with our congregations of how they can become more vital. And it's not a quick fix. There are no magic wands. There are no silver bullets. There are no easy three steps and we're ready to, to grow. We know it's hard work, oh God. So we give you thanks for the opportunity to participate perhaps in a pathway that's gonna help us get unstuck. It's gonna help us launch new things. It's gonna help us develop that, that vision you have for our congregation, help us discover and discern that next right step. So I just give you thanks for everyone who participated tonight, for the opportunity to share from our hearts that which we are so passionate about, reaching people for Jesus Christ. So bless them, O oh God, as they begin to discern what, what you're calling them to do, whether you're calling them to apply for one of these initiatives, one of these pathways. So be with us all as we conclude our time tonight together, O oh God. Bless our churches and our ministries in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Thank you again for coming and we will see, hopefully see you next week. Good night now.